Hello again from Down Under. Well, here we are on the probe front again. Here's the Mark III version. This has got quite a lot of refinements over the Mark II. This is the old Mark II and the original um, Tormark Passive Probe that I started with about a year ago. Put a lot of hours into developing this. Um, many thanks to those of you who've contacted me with encouragement. I um, most appreciate that. It's really helped to spur me on to put the time in to develop this latest version of the probe. Um, I've done a lot of research and a lot of development and perhaps I'll try and explain a bit of a general background to probes because I know a lot of people are considering buying a probe. They want uh, the, the quick setup of a probe but they're also aware that uh, there's a lot of issues with them. Um, they can be unreliable and they can be inaccurate and you can break them uh, and so a lot of people are holding off. Um, um, so you've got high-end probes to start with, you've got the Marplos, uh, and you've got Heidenhain, you've got the Renishaw and Haas Renishaw Partnership and um, Blum and others, uh, several thousand dollars, two or three, four thousand um, dollars for a high-end, highly sensitive, highly accurate probe which is fluid filled, not user serviceable and fragile and accurate to within microns um, but you do need to have software that will allow you to make the compensation adjustments for the inherent inaccuracies in this type of electromechanical probe. If you don't have a high-end machine and the high-end software that allows you to make those compensation adjustments, it's probably not really worth, uh, you probably cannot justify that level of investment. So, so then you're looking at the low-end range of probes and there's a whole lot of low-end probes. They are problematic from the ones I've studied and I haven't studied them all, but they are not fluid filled, or as far as I know, all of the low end probes are not fluid filled, and so you get problems with corrosion, friction, wear, arcing, or oxidizing. Now, depending on the contact materials that you choose, you can reduce some of those areas of problems, but not all of them. And ultimately, you need to have uh, a fluid filled or fluid lubricated contact points on your probe for it to be reliable. That's why all the high-end probes are fluid filled and uh, hermetically sealed and not uh, user serviceable. What I've tried to do with this probe is to give both the benefits of the high-end probe and the costs of the low-end probe. So I'll gather my breath and think about the next little explanation and then carry on. Okay, well another problem with the low-end probes is that in order to get around those problems with contamination of the contacts and erratic electrical tripping, they have a very stiff actuation, for example a stiff spring. Um, and the problem with that is that because you've got a self-sacrificing fragile stylus, you get a lot of flex of the stem and that makes them inaccurate. And the stiff spring makes it a little bit more reliable, but ultimately not reliable long term. I know a lot of people that have bought low cost probes that have just put them away in a box or in a drawer and are just not using them anymore. So my challenge was to find a way to have light spring actuation uh, and a uh, crash proof and um, to have the contact points reliable and lasting long term and I found with many tests and trials that I needed to have the contact points lubricated. So what this probe has got, the Mark III has got, is little pockets on each of the three sets of contacts that accept a special fluid compound. It's a, 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 not just any old fluid but a specially developed fluid that doesn't run out because it's not hermetically sealed, it just has a small quantity of this fluid and it's a bit like a uh, fluid grease that won't run out in a hurry um, and it keeps those contact points lubricated um, and free of oxidization and keeps cleaning them and cuts down on the friction as the arms ride over the balls and that allows them to be a lot more accurate.
okay so this specially developed fluid grease has to be fluid enough to work like the oil does in the high-end probes but not so fluid that it runs out when the probe is turned over on its side it just would be impractical so the reality of this compound is that it would take several days before it would become a problem I suppose the only downside with this design um, is that you do need to store it in its upright position, in its as used position. Um, if, if you lay it on its side, particularly in a hot climate, and left it there for some time, several days, um, then the special fluid would begin to migrate away from the contact points. So the only downside is you need to have a block or a box, perhaps it'll come in a box like that, and it's in the drawer of your cabinet or on top of your cabinet, um, and you just store it that way um, and then there should be no issues with the fluid migrating out because it is kept held in little pockets that, that are themselves sealed okay so i'll just go on now to go through some of the features of this mark three hallmark impact tolerant touch probe so the way to adjust this type of adjustment is to rotate the spindle and watch the dial indicator dial and see the total movement so you're just under 0.2 of a millimeter run out there so turn the spindle until the needle on the indicator is most anti-clockwise which is there then take the adjusting screw on the front and adjust it half that amount which is about nine hundredths and now you are within about two hundredths so we need one more adjustment when it's at its most anti-clockwise again I'm probably blocking the camera now and you can see now it's spot on so it's a very quick way to adjust the concentri concentricity of the uh, spherical tip Okay, so let's run a crash test with the new Hallmark Impact Tolerant Touch Probe. Say you do something horribly wrong, you just forget to plug in or you forget to look. That would be the end of an ordinary probe stem. And even after a severe crash like that, it's almost still concentric. That shock has knocked it out very slightly, uh, maybe a micron. So if you did have a big crash, it would pay to check it um, and maybe tweak it if you're doing precision work before you go on with your planned probing routine. You might usually want to find the front left hand corner of your part. That seems to be a very common um, reference, datum point. Um, Pathpilot is very good at finding that quickly. Just one button will do that. And you have X, Y, set. I'm sure most of you will be aware that these touch probes can find the Z as well. Um, so it's X, Y, Z, very rapid finding. <coughs> and this um, impact tolerant touch probe is also impact tolerant in the Z direction. Let's just crash it in the Z direction. No harm done. So your probing routine, routine for setting uh, Z, again it's just a button. So once you've got your tool table set up with the uh, spherical end diameter and set the length of the probe up with the um, wizard that lets you do that very quickly, then you can quickly find your parts X, Y and Z according to your preference of a corner or a center in a matter of seconds really and this is, this is the huge advantage of touch probes. Okay, so let's measure the accuracy of this uh, new 
Mark III probe. So um, with the dial indicator on the spherical tip in contact, um, we're going to measure what's called the pre-travel. That is the travel between mechanical contact and electrical trip. So if I just jog at a very slow rate into our face, you'll see the dial indicator has moved three hundredths of a millimeter. That's the distance between mechanical contact and electrical trip. So we move to a different position. Try it again, getting it two and a half hundredths of a millimeter. So take it to another position and try it again. We're getting just over for just on three and a half hundredths. Sorry, I'm not at a good distance to see it here. So, what we're looking for here is the dif the difference in pre-travel between different points of the tri swing arm inside the um, probe. And this is a, a an error that all probes have, even the high end probes. Um, and and it's the the actual pre-travel is not as important as not as important as the difference in pre-travel between different rotary orientations, as I've mentioned in my other videos. So just talking and measuring at the same time is not the best, but I'm getting between two and four hundredths of a millimeter. It's about three. It's about two. and that's nearly four hundredths. So on the outsides between two and four hundredths of a millimeter that is a average deviation of um, pre-travel of three hundredths of a millimeter and a plus or minus variation that's the key uh, value of one hundredths of a millimeter that's about a half a thou. So this amount of error this pre-travel variation of between two and four hundredths of a millimeter coming from the, this current test um, is, is quite good for a, a low-cost probe. For example, the uh, Tormac Passive Probe, you'll see from my earlier video series, has a, a pre-travel variation between five hundredths and 0.11. That's a total of um, six hundredths of a millimeter pre-travel variation versus this probe which has got two hundredths of a millimeter. Um, all the same it's not this, this these low-cost probes and, and this probe as well are not extremely accurate um, designed for high-end work. They're not designed for precision digitizing or working with a high-end uh, vertical machining center. They, they um, uh, better suited to use a high-end probe um, which has spindle and, and if you've got a machine and software that has spindle orientation and um, compensation uh, software for calibrating the probe then you can work to microns. What we're talking about here is uh, plus or minus a hundredth of a millimeter or half a thou. Um, it's good for workshop situations um, for people on a budget um, and it's not suitable for high-end work or for um, doing uh, digitizing work. I haven't checked it um, in, in that application where you're making hundreds or thousands of, of uh, touchdowns and generating a point cloud. Um, it may work in that situation but I haven't tested it and, I, and you need to test things to destruction to be sure of their capabilities. But it is a very practical, low-cost, um, and accurate workshop probe. Thanks for bearing with me on this long video. I was going to go into production uh, of the Mark II probe, uh, but then I could see some uh, refinements and improvements, and it really doesn't pay to rush the uh, development phase. A, a product needs to be really well resolved, refined, the best version of itself that it can be before you go into production. Um, but it's taken a while and I'm sorry for the delays. Um, if you're still interested in this um, 
Mark III probe, um, given that it's got to be stored vertically, um, the downsides, and it will be a little bit more expensive. Um, but if you can see the benefits in your situation and you would like one of these probes, please send me an email. If you've already sent me an email, please update that um, with a, a forward or a, a reply to let me know if you're interested or not interested. Um, I'm trying to assess now the scale of interest and whether I do a, 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 a large or a small production run. Um, so my email address is cliffhalldesign at gmail.com. Um, it'd be really appreciated. Um, oh, I just feel a little bad about being negative about, uh, I sound a little negative about other low cost probes. Um, it's just been my experience that they're not reliable or accurate, the ones that I've heard of or have tested. But if you know of a low cost probe that is uh, accurate and reliable long term and doesn't need regular maintenance, um, please contact me with the details. I'd be really interested to learn about it. I'm always trying to be open minded. Um, I just don't know of one that's in existence. Thanks for your uh, patience on this video. Cheers.